race, legalism versus freedom. And we have the Wailing Wall, which Joan and I were there with some of our friends a few years ago. And we were there among the Jewish rabbis and the Jewish crowd at the Wailing Wall as they are there with the law. They have a little podium there at the Wailing Wall and they have all their books and scrolls of the law with them when they come to pray at the Wailing Wall. And then you have on the other side the cross and freedom represented by the lady giving praise to God. And I couldn't help but put the little ball and chain there of legalism because that, yeah, that's exactly kind of what it is. So to give you a little description, experiencing the ugliness of bondage the legalism based Christianity. That's almost really a oxymoron to somewhat to, to say it that way. But uh, to illustrate the point, we have to do it. Versus experiencing the beauty of grace and freedom in the righteousness of God. How many rejoice today in the righteousness of God? Let's ask the Lord to speak to us today. Father, I thank you for the Word of God which makes all the difference to our lives. We feast on it. We live by it. We live and die by it. We thank you for speaking to us today. And we thank you for all that are here today to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Don't know who said this, but I uh, can't give credit, but I found it and put it in our notes for today. Not by the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. And that is so true. Throughout the years as a pastor, I have worked with, cried with, prayed with so many people that were in the bondage of legalism in their attempted walk with God. And it's, it's not a pretty picture. And sometimes we find our own selves caught in that. The, the Paul in his ministry and his writing of all of the good portion of the New Testament, everywhere he went, by and large, somehow, some way, this subject was something he had to defend. And the book of Romans is, of course, where a lot is found concerning this subject. But I want to tell you, this is a very important subject because we have so many people that we know of that no longer darken the door of a church. So many people that left the church and even left following Christ because of a church that demanded such legalism and put such a burden on people's lives. And it was, it was just a... It was a thing that discouraged a lot, and it's hard for, to get those people back to where they need to understand the truth of grace and back with God. And it's a sad story. One of the churches, one of my first churches that I took uh, when we come out of Southeastern, <laughs> the, uh, the church and the pastor before me was... They, they, they loved legalism. I mean, they just absolutely loved it. They had signs everywhere to tell how much they loved it. They had rules everywhere. I mean, before you could sing in the choir or be a part of the church, they had these, I mean, it, was, it wasn't the Ten Commandments. It was something they came up with. Someone has said legalism adds rules to the divine laws and treats them as divine. Can I give you that again? 
Legalism adds rules to divine laws and treats them as divine. This church and this pastor had put all this stuff up and they were treating it as the gospel and as the divine law of what you had to do and what you couldn't do and what you had to do and this and that and everything in between. They had everything but a yardstick to measure women's dresses, how long they were. Uh, <laughs> and, and of course, uh, my father always said that these women that wear lipstick, he said even a barn looks better with paint on it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that goes to tell you that my father was not a legalist. <laughs> my father was not a legalist. And he was he came into he came into full gospel Pentecostal pastoring at, at the time that the Assemblies of God was only 15 years in the making. Yeah, he, 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 went, he came into the holiness movement, but he had, he had an understanding of the Word of God that is what God does on the inside, not following a bunch of rules that people have made divine. Legalism, people attempt to secure righteousness in God by works, by performance. See, all the components, all the different concepts of our salvation, whether it's justification, whether it's regeneration, we can name off 20 different terminologies that, uh, that have to do with our experience and our salvation in Christ. But it all starts with God's grace. Grace. She was a beautiful lady, but she is a beautiful term in the scriptures. Grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Experiencing the ugly bondage of legalism. Base Christianity, not a good thing. Experiencing the beauty of grace and freedom in the righteousness of God. Listen, a relationship with God is a whole lot better than religion. The religion of men. God brings us into a relationship with Him. And that's what we, we, we walk in a relationship with God. Now the first part of the message is a little bit dark. But I have to do this to explain the difference between the ugly bondage of legalism and the beauty of grace. No prison is as restrictive as the prison of legalism. And everybody said, oh, wow, true. Its bars are built out of misconception of God, out of false theology that salvation is predicated on performance. If I do what God wants me to do, if I perform just right, I can have righteousness or I can be accepted by God if I can just perform what I know that he must desire from me. Well, I'll tell you what, just right off the bat, just forget that idea because there's nothing we can do. There's absolutely nothing we can do in performance that will impress God. Have you ever met someone that you got the idea they were trying to impress God while they were trying to impress you as well? With this mindset, guilt, this legalism mindset, guilt is declared but never resolved. Effort demanded but never accepted. Requirements proclaimed but never satisfied. So oppressive is the environment that the soul cries out like Paul, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Was he the man to cry that out? I mean, he made quite a transition as a person of the law to grace, didn't he? Some of the translations of Romans 7, 24 go like this. Pitiful creature I am, who is to set me free from
from a nature doomed to death was one tra Knox translation. But thank God, thank the grace of God through Jesus Christ who has come to set us free from the doom of death. This guilt declared but never resolved. Effort demanded but never accepted. Requirements proclaimed but never satisfied. Very oppressive is the environment. Legalism stalks its victims with vengeance. I said legalism stalks its victims with vengeance. Unresolved guilt, insecurity, fear, insomnia, and even high blood pressure. Regrets, shame, anger. This is the merchandise of legalism. The law becomes the instrument of death. It demands, its demands crush. Its claims paralyze. Its requirements immobilize. Its victims are scattered on the roadways of life and in the parking lots of our churches. Legalism. It's a sad story. And Jordan and I know people that are not in church today because they went to a church where legalism was more important than Jesus. It's a sad story. I was in line one day at a 7-Eleven, I believe it was, years ago, and this girl, was she was going off with somebody in line with where I was behind her. She was telling this other person what her church did not believe in. Man, she rattled off about 15 things what her church didn't believe in. And I kind of interrupted her. I said, well, do you know what your church believes in? Well, 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 uh, uh, well no, but I know what we don't believe in. <laughs> Pitiful. Pitiful. The grace of God rightly understood. I said the grace of God rightly understood becomes the only path, becomes the only path to authentic Christianity. Can we say amen? amen. How many want to be for real? Authentic Christianity. Very important. Paul in the book of Romans teaches us about grace. Grace fulfills the law and does it perfectly in Christ. Paul in the book of Romans charted the path by which faith moves from law, which awakens us to sin. It awakens us to our failure to meet God's demands. Faith moves from law to grace, which satisfies its demands. Christians who struggle have it backwards. It's true. For them, life of faith is a ladder to which they must climb rather than to cling to. Can we say that again? The Christians who struggle have it backwards. The life of faith is a ladder on which you must climb rather than a hand to which you must cling. The inversion of human effort over God's gift of favor. I said it's the inversion of human effort over God's gift of favor. Problems arise when the people of God have a faulty understanding in the way that God deals with people. And the result is a terrible, terrible bondage. However, a correct understanding of God's ways leads to a glorious freedom, as Paul teaches in Romans. The transition from law to grace is a most life-changing experience. Amen? Amen? The journey from law to grace brings wonderful hope to troubled hearts. God's grace received and understood will work its liberating power in you, setting you free from performance-based Christianity. Paul's world was different. Paul's contemporaries were different. They would have only known one kind of righteousness, and that was the one attempted, I should say, to, to be obtained through 
the law, works centered. Paul's teaching of righteousness bestowed a grace given, a divine favor imparted would have been incomprehensible to his Jewish friends. It was un incomprehensible to them. You've got to understand, they, they could not comprehend such a thing. Yet, righteousness from God apart from the law, Paul said, was possible because of the grace of God. You've got to, when I was putting this together, I began to think about the, the people, the Jewish people, People that Paul knew, and they knew Paul. Paul was the, was a the Harvard man, so to speak, in his day. And they knew he knew all of the law, and he knew all the customs. He knew it all, and he knew it better than any others. And when he started talking about righteousness of God apart from the law, that was like a brick hitting them in the head, man. It was different. You got to understand that how different, and even today, how difficult it is for the Jewish people to receive that. Paul's letter to the Romans is all about solving the problem with sin or lawlessness. In First John three four speaks of that. You got to deal with the sin problem. You got to deal with God's wrath. If you got the sin problem, then you got God's wrath. You got to deal with both. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I like Lawrence Lee said, God helps our falling shorts. <laughs> I love that. I'm here glad that God helps our falling shorts in more ways than one. For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The question is, how can we escape the wrath of God? How can we become justified or right with God? In Romans, Paul reveals the solution to sin. The, the solution to sin is God's grace and the cross of Jesus Christ. The grace of God is the totality by which men and women are made righteous. It's by His grace. And then you have always, you always have these people. They're in every group. They're everywhere. They've got to pipe up when you start talking about grace. Oh, okay, you're going to be too soft on sin, are you? There's always somebody that's going to bring that little thing up. But we're not talking about being soft on sin. We're talking about the great God who is great in His mercy and great in His grace. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you'll want to do everything you can to fulfill the laws of God. Even in some of those in the Old Testament, when we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will, we will want to do everything to give glory to God and fulfill everything He has for us to be. We as sinners are able to be justified as a gift. Everybody say, as a gift. If you work, you get wages. But if it's a gift, you don't have to work for it. Come on. Justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. In Romans 3.24, Paul says, But they are justified for nothing. Now we don't, we're, you know... We want to have some, we want to be able to claim we did something. We want to say, I did something. A hamburger helper, I helped. You know, I did something. But, we, but Paul says, but they are justified for nothing by his grace. Moffat gives it that way. And justification comes to us as a free gift of his grace. Knox puts it that way. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, through the act of liberation in the person of Jesus Christ. How many are glad you've been liberated by the grace of God and through Jesus Christ? Titus 3, 7 said that being justified by his grace, not by our works, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Man struggles with this thing called grace. If you understand it, 
you'll be so blessed by it. When you don't understand it, you've, you've this element. Even even the New Testament Christians, they were always trying to bring works back in. They they were they were set free and they were blessed with the grace of God and with the teaching of Paul. But every so often you read somebody was trying to bring a little bit of law back in. We got to have a little bit of that. Come on. We did, it was so good. We got to have a little bit of it. Try to have a little bit of both. No. It's, it's, it's all the grace of God. Titus 3, 7. But that being justified by grace, not by our works, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Man cannot merit salvation no matter how much good he tries to do. Can't do it. Can't do it. But somehow, some way, we want to add something back. Romans three twenty seven. Then what can we boast about? See, that's the that's the thing. What can we boast about? Doing to earn our salvation? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. Okay, puts it. By what law, question mark? By what works, question mark? No, nay, but by the law of faith. That's kind of the crush of the matter. Then what can we boast about doing to earn our salvation? I helped, Lord, I helped. No, no. Paul says we have access by faith into this grace. <coughs> Pardon me. We have access by faith into this grace we're talking about. Romans 5, 1, 2, and 21. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God had in mind for us to be. Tate puts it that way. I love that rendition. Look at this now. Look at it again. For by grace, into this grace wherein we stand, I mean stand in the grace of God today, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God had in mind for us to be. How many knows that God had a plan? And God has a purpose for your life, and He's bringing us along. How many knows you're still under construction? Yeah, I think that uh, Mrs. Graham, we went to the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte, and they talked about her tombstone and had actually uh, there at the, at the site. And she always kept saying, no matter how old she was, no matter how long she served the Lord, no matter how great a saint of God she was, she always told the audience, I'm still a woman under construction. God is making me the person that he wants me to be. Aren't you glad for the long-suffering of God? That he, he, he's so long-suffering and he's so gracious in his grace that he keeps working on us. He keeps working on us. And what I'm amazed, he knew all this before he brought me in. But he knew how pitiful I was going to be to work with. He knew that. But yet he said, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take a chance. I'm going to work with that boy. Dr. Dobson said his wife had left one day and left him with the kids and he had a little boy. He was about eight years old, seven. And he couldn't find him. He said, I was watching. He said, just in a second, he was gone. 
He said, man, he said, I, I, I was in charge to look after the kids. And he said, I looked, I looked out the backyard. I couldn't find the little kid, little tot, couldn't find him. And then he looked way in the backyard, and he was hanging off of a, off, off of a pickup truck, half on and half off, hanging on the back of the lid. And he, as he was going to him to, to rescue him, he heard, he heard the boy crying out. The boy was crying out, somebody help this boy! Somebody help this boy! That's what the little boy was crying. Somebody help this boy. How many of you ever felt like you've been on the half on and half off on the truck of life and you're crying out to the God of creation and said, somebody's got to help this boy? How many of you ever been there? Yes. To actually becoming all that God had in mind for us to be. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned, I'll give somebody a dollar if they catch that fly. Yeah. That as sin has reigned in death, the whole outlook changes. Sin used to be the master of men, and in the end handed at them over to death. Philip's translation. Even so, mighty grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now grace is the ruling factor. How many are now that grace is the ruling factor? Come on. Come on. Before, we didn't have that. Now grace is the ruling factor. Philip's translation translates that. Romans 8, 1, you know this by heart. There is therefore now no condemnation which are in Christ Jesus. There is no doom now. <laughs> One translation, Moffat says, there's no doom now. We're not doomed anymore. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The old vicious circle of sin and death no longer exists. Come on. Paul clearly believed that grace has set us free. Yet he also clearly understood that God sets us free by grace through a certain law, namely called the law of faith in that, that great gospel message. Grace stands in opposition to works which lacks the power to save. If works had the power to save, then the reality of grace would be annulled. We finish out with Romans eleven six, and if by grace, then it no more of works. If and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Ephesians two five. Even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Somebody help that boy. Somebody help that girl. It was you. 2 Timothy 1 9, who hath saved, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to works, not for anything we have done, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he's given us in Christ Jesus before the world ever began. My gracious Allah. Even as mature Christians, if we're not careful, it's easy to find ourselves moving back towards performance-based Christianity. It's easy. It's so subtle. It's so easy to creep back into that. We do have spiritual initiatives. We have things, responsibilities as believers that we're called on to do. We, we understand that. But our salvation is not performance-based. It's only based on the performance of God's grace.